Oh shit, we got Donna War music coming off right after the beginning. This video was made by Sci-Fi Kai. Um, I'm not seeing a shout out to me in this video. I don't know what it is with nobody giving uh, shout outs, but uh, I'm just automatically assuming that he stole my content because it says, could they survive? Because I'm going to act like I'm the first and only person that ever come up with that kind of video. <laughs> Yo, just joking. All right, let's get, let's get a look. The Adeptus Astartes, or more commonly known as the Space Marines, are the genetically enhanced super soldiers of the 41st millennium. These angels of death clad in futuristic power armor are trained and equipped to fight. Okay, uh, I, I, I have a, a, a critique right off the bat. You gotta get rid of that cadence. The Adeptus Custodes and this the power armor, it's kind of like, uh, it kind of reminds, like I'm exaggerating a little bit more, but that's kind of like the Burger King foot lead ass. The last thing you would want in your Burger King burger. Don't, don't drag it off. Say it as it is. All right. Today we got some spas maroons and they're going to be fighting off against the necromorphs. D don't drag off the cadence, man. Don't do it. All right, let's hit Against the worst the galaxy has to offer. From the never ending swarm of the Tyranids, the ancient Tyranids. immortal Necrons, or even the monstrous demons which inhabit the Immaterium. If there's one thing Astartes are used to, it's never-ending war with nightmarish alien species, which makes them the perfect candidate to be put up against the Necromorphs from the Dead Space franchise. Aggressive, grotesque, unrelenting, and capable of easily ripping armed men apart, the Necromorphs represent an <laughs> horrific transformation of the human form, designed with the sole purpose of eliminating life in the most violent and, well, unpleasant ways possible. This is a video Dude, request. I've that's what it's got to be like for those females that go inside the uh, female restroom and like those it's ma'ams go use the restroom too. That's got to be some scary shit. Lancer, 737, five bucks. Thank you, my good man. Really appreciate it. For my B-Day, please make could Master Chief with Doom Slayer with Draco survive Thanos, but all with one Infinity Stone. Doctor Strange hid one of them. <laughs> Just like this crazy plot line, eh? Where's your birthday, man? I've gotten for a while now, and while normally I pick a single setting Thank or you, game dude. to put a character through, this time our Space Marine will journey through all three games, from the start three, of the Ishimura yeah. to the end of Tau Volantis. And while from a hypothetical narrative perspective, it wouldn't make much sense for a Space Marine to be in the exact position Isaac found himself in, the point of the series is to throw every possible obstacle the setting has to offer at the character. Otherwise, they could potentially skip past massive parts of the scenario. Now, I had a tough time deciding on which Space Marine to use for this video. With so many chapters guess, and Titus. characters to choose from, <laughs> but ultimately I decided to go with Titus from the recently <laughs> oh, shit, released I got it right. <laughs> Besides the fact that he's a character many newcomers will be familiar with, he's also an Ultramarine, which are the poster boys for the entire franchise, and the chapter kind of represents your average vanilla Astartes. But before we begin, we have seven, to right? set some ground rules for the scenario. The first being that Titus will be able to find ammo for his various weapons in whatever location he's in, since it'd be pretty lame if he just couldn't use his own arsenal. The second rule is that Titus can't call for help, so no having other Ultramarines help him or the entire Ultramarine chapter warping in to fight- I don't like this idea already. I- Okay, I like the idea of hit, of taking, you know, Lieutenant Titus now and throwing him in there. That's perfectly fine. But him running around in the Dead Space universe means the whole point of him is surviving in that universe, not having unlimited ammo of his own weapons from his own universe. I actually think that that is lame. He's supposed to survive in the Dead Space universe, which means that once you run out of ammo with your bolter, now you're actually surviving in that in that universe, so to speak. You got what you can carry. The Brethren Moons, though we might talk a bit about that at the end. I'd also like to mention I'm a relatively new 40k fan, having just got into the franchise about a year ago, and with there being over 300 novels, a good chunk of which are Astartes focused, I'm sure I'll miss a feat or relevant bit of lore. Quick thanks to you guys for getting me to- Don't worry about it dude, um, there's no canon no more. 5k. And if you enjoy videos like this, I have plenty of others already up on my channel and more planned in the near future. So consider dropping a like on the video and subbing to the channel. I'd greatly appreciate you helping me appease the algorithm gods. But with the intro stuff out of the way, 
let's begin by breaking down Titus and the Space Marines. All right, let's hear it, boys. What's up, Luca? Uh, Check. do you agree with me that letting Titus have unlimited ammo pretty much defeats the purpose of, like, trying to survive in another universe? You're trying to survive in that universe. Giving him, like, unlimited supplies, I think, ruins it. I absolutely love this cutscene. You guys know I have to be an asshole. You know, you know I gotta call it the way it is. I love what I love the most about this like cinematic is how Tyranids don't swarm and instead they run in like this Congo line of one at a time. Instead of all jumping on top of a space marine like five to ten at a time. They just they just line up and come one at a time while the warrior just sits in the back with his four arms and he's just waiting his turn. Oh, you killed all my little uh, underlings? I guess it's my turn now. As mentioned in the intro, Space Marines are the Look, genetically there. enhanced super soldiers of the Imperium. And without getting too lost in the weeds, Wait. that is the vast amount of Space Marine Wait. lore. There One, are two, watch, watch, many watch. Legions of space Bam, he locks arms. He locks arms. Excuse me. Yo. You got four arms, my man. Why Why aren't you using them? This is why people got so mad at me when I... Look at you got four arms, dude. You're, you've already locked up Titus's arms up here in the front. You've got like rending claws back here. And my man ain't even moving them. They, they doing nothing. And then you just die. Okay, I'm sorry. This is off topic. Space Marines that all have their own specialties, Look at differences, and sometimes even cultures. These different groups of Marines are referred to as chapters, and each chapter can be entirely unique. For example, the Space Wolves have heightened senses, instincts, and increased ferocity in battle, even compared to the already heightened senses of an Astartes. Damn, the my man uses are and stronger than most other Marine chapters, and I could go on about all their quirks for hours, but the could chapter you? that's important for this video are the Ultramarines. Not only the God, poster that boys bad. for the franchise, but they're about as vanilla as Space Marines can get. They're known for their adaptability and being the Swiss army knife of the Imperium, a jack of all trades, but masters of none. The transformation into an Astartes the is an logistics. extreme one. The average Ultramarine is eight feet tall and including power armor can weigh between 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. And this isn't including the weaponry they carry. During the surgery, they also develop backups for pretty much every organ in their body. Uh, actually, the average space marine is about seven feet tall, eight feet tall in his armor. Now, the primaris marines are just a little bit taller than that, though. Including having two hearts. On top of the massive increase in height, weight, and strength, is an increased lifespan and slower aging. Titus, during the events of Space Marine 2, is confirmed over 400 years old, yet looks like he's in his 40s or 50s. The power armor in Astartes is equipped with is connected directly to the black carapace fused to their skin, which allows their armor to interface with their nervous system to aid in targeting and making the armor feel almost weightless to the marine, basically making it like a second skin. Most of the armor is covered in thick plates of ceramide, which are capable of taking hits from heavy bolters, which can shred APC armor. Now it can be pretty contentious with how durable space marine armor is, the durability can vary drastically from story to story. This is Some true. think a 50 cal could crack the armor and others think they could survive small nukes. So I'm trying to go for a bit of a lower end mid ball interpretation here. When it comes- It depends on who's writing the story and how well the writers understand what is going on. Um, a 50 caliber, it depends on the type of ammunition that you're using. But like, let's say that you're using like an armor piercing round. I would say that at the it should at least be able to crack the helmet and kill a space marine. The the polderins or the chest plate it could probably withstand it. To the various weapons and Astartes can have access to, there's just way too many to cover individually. So the equipment we'll be giving Titus are the weapons we. 
And, and one of the reasons that I use for this too is there's numerous stories of space marines getting into fights, especially with chaos space marines, where they're essentially chunking and breaking the other person's ceramite just by punching them and shit. So, no, I know that's not exactly the same thing, but when you think about like the kinetic energy of what it takes from a space marine to punch some dude and to be cracking his ceramite armor and shit, and then you've got a, a 50 caliber rifle and the type of round and what kind of powder, like what kind of charge is in there. If you've got an armor piercing round, dude, if a space ring can punch another dude and, and crack his ceramite armor, a 50 caliber round with, with a uh, an armor piercing round should be able to do it. We see him use on all of the trailers and cutscenes, that being the standard bolter rifle, bolt pistol, and chain sword. But throughout the video, I might talk a bit about other weapons and how they would fare as well. The closest right. thing we have to a bolt rifle in real life would be something like the M79 grenade launcher that fires 40 millimeter grenades. But unlike a grenade, bolter ammo is rocket propelled and fires straight instead of arcing, and bolt rifles are also fully automatic. Both in lore and in game, they're capable of shredding through heavily armored Tyranid warriors, and ah, even a say that. round from the bolt pistol. Ah, I wouldn't say that, dude. It takes like a whole magazine to take one of them damn things down. Can explode normal humans into red mist. Something I really gotta stress is the size difference of Space Marines and their various weapons. Here's a size comparison of an Astarte standing next to a normal human, and as we know, most Necromorphs are relative to humans in size, so this is about the size difference we're looking at between a Space Marine and your average slasher. Hell, many of the weapons themselves are almost as big, if not bigger, than a grown ass man. Marines are actually so fast and large that just running into a normal human can cause them to explode on impact. They're damn near <laughs> walking tanks. The chainsword is pretty self-explanatory, but one important thing to note is that Astartes can rip enemies that are relative to them in strength apart with just their bare hands rather Speaking of this, there there was a a story. I think it was a story where Marnius Calgar from the Ultramarines punches an avatar Puts a hole right through him. I believe when he charged the Avatar, it's been years since I read this story, but they described Marnius Calgar as being so massive and he just barrels towards that Avatar that he's essentially like stepping and crushing Eldar in his path as he's like barreling towards it. Ah, just punches a hole right through it and one shots the Avatar. That's the whole purpose of the Avatar in Warhammer 40k, is to be summoned to, to look like a total badass, but only to just get annihilated to show how badass the other person is. I swear, every story with the Avatar is him getting his ass kicked. But it's Eldar, what do you expect? Hell, they can even do this to enemies much larger and stronger than them, even if they're armored. Oh, yo, this is a good time to pause it yet again to piss you guys off. Okay, in, in the uh, the Tyranid Omnibus, that shit was funny. It, the way that the book started off was really good. Uh, one of the stories was, it was a swarm lord with a bunch of Carnifexes as his bodyguards, right? He had like, I don't know, four to six Carnifexes as his bodyguards. And the they're fighting Eldar. The Eldar are getting desperate and they managed to summon the Avatar. And it says like, you know, this bellowing beast of like smoke. And he like points at the uh, the Swarm Lord, like lets out like this nasty screech or whatever to challenge it. They said this like Tyranids have no concept of honor, fear, nothing. They don't give a shit. All the Swarm Lord did was like nudge, like go kill him. And all the Carnifex just turned around just charged the avatar and just shredded him apart. Dude, I was laughing when I read that. I was like, ha, 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 exactly. That's all the avatar does is die in the stories. He didn't kill a single one as far as I know. The, it, can you imagine summoning that dude? The avatar, he's here. And then he like challenges the swarm lord. Fight me 1v1, bitch. And all them carnifexes just turn around. Just jump on top of him. It just dies. All the Eldar were like, their morale broke. Ah, squad broken. I'm like, and then, dude, the book started off so good. And then it immediately just turns into like some weird fanfic. 
Uh, nasty shit when it comes to Eldar, like one of the farcier dudes like wakes up and they describe like his abs are all sweaty and his silk sheets are like stuck to his hard body. And I'm like, what is this? I don't want to read this no more. Go back to the Tyranids. We got Nella coming in with a 20 bucks. Thank you, my good man. I greatly appreciate that. I have found the story you mentioned. It has a nice ending and how wonderful when they bring gifts. You'll, notice, you'll not be aware of this, but the polymorphine drug you metabolize so often gives you humans, you gives human essence such a uh, delicate flavoring. You're right. That's the deceiver. Exactly, dude. It's a good story. Thank you, my man. I greatly appreciate that. By the way, that Carnifex is kind of tiny. A most impressive cleansing, brothers. So with all that being said, how does Titus fare against the Necromorphs, and can he survive the events of the original Dead Space? The start of the game is pretty simple. We have our first few Necromorph encounters, most of which being your standard slashers. And while Necromorphs can be pretty strong, ranging from peak human to superhuman levels of speed and strength, the size and power gap between most Necros and the Astartes is oh. far too large for them to pose any real threat. Oh, At the shit. start of Dead Space 2, Isaac gets impaled by a slasher, and while it does almost kill him, if Isaac could survive an attack completely unarmored, then I highly doubt they could even pierce the Ceramite armor capable of oh, taking high explosive and armor penetrating rounds. As we discussed earlier, most Uh, in the Grey Knight Omnibus, there was an instance of barbaric it was a it was an old world where humans were still essentially like in the stone age if i can remember this correctly they basically had like clubs and rocks and shit like that but they were tainted by chaos and the gray knights i think there was like maybe a few thousand of them and there was a whole squad of gray knights fully armored ready to face the demons and they said it was uh Falric is what his name was, I think, if I can remember correctly. Falric or Alric, I forget what his name was. Anyways, my man said, there's no way we can fight these. That if we were to fight these humans, that even their weight alone would crush us and kill us. Because, dude, so if you really think about that, and it was also the same thing in, um, I think his name was Alric, by the way. He was he was the uh, great eye captain there. Uh, who else was there? Eisenhorn. There was a there was a point where they were in a hive city and there were, the people started rioting, and there was a space marine that was there, and the space marine also was at risk of getting crushed to death under the bodies of the people. So you know I, this is why I, there's there's a lot of uh, exaggerations when it comes to how strong a space marine is. Is a space marine strong? Absolutely. Can a space marine punch your face off? Absolutely. But this idea that like, you know, a hundred bodies jumping on top of you and you're just laying there while they're all sticking and stabbing into you and you're like, I'm impervious to damage. You get enough bodies on top of you, dude, you get crushed. Necros are relative to Inconsistent humans in size. Writing? You're just so a there's bigot. no reason Titus couldn't easily rip them apart with his bare hands or with any of his multiple weapons. The power gap is so significant that it makes pretty much every standard necromorph type a non-threat. I'm confident he could literally just stand there and- So right off the bat from this get-go, he's giving the space marine too much of a power gap. Uh, I don't want to sound like an asshole, but I think this is somebody who hasn't read the books, but instead is looking at other lore videos and taking that at face value. Allow himself to be hit and they just never do any damage. Of course, as Titus makes his way through the ship, he's eventually going to come across various doors. And don't get me wrong, dude, don't get me wrong. Titus would be strong in this situation, but to make it sound like he would basically be impervious and that he would just be wading through these things like no problem, I don't buy it. Or things in need of repair, or need to find an alternate way around them. Not only is Titus not an engineer What's of up, any JX? kind, but with Dead Space being a completely different universe, the technology is substantially different. So if you think Titus can't find ways around issues like the ADS cannons, then he probably doesn't survive the Ishimura. However, while a majority of standard Necromorph types wouldn't pose any threat, let's talk about some of the stronger variants. The Brute is capable of ramming through reinforced steel doors, which is pretty impressive. Unfortunately, compared to Titus once again, 
they're pretty much a non-threat. Titus can fight hundreds. You're crazy, dude. You're crazy. What are you? He's pretty much a non-threat. Oh shit! All right. Hundreds of Tyranids at once, with many of them rivaling him in strength, as well as fighting heavily armored enemies like the Carnifex. That, despite being bigger and stronger than him, he can rip apart with his bare hands. The brute being so much smaller and weaker in comparison to both Titus and the enemies he's fought for hundreds of years oh, makes shit. the brute a bit of a joke. Its armor doesn't mean much since it likely isn't strong enough to take a bolter fire, and even if it was, just like the Carnifex, Titus would just rip it off, not even mentioning the fact that his back is a massive weak spot. The Weezers and food storage could be a threat, if Titus didn't have a pressurized suit that filtered out toxins and allows him to breathe in the vacuum of space. The Leviathan could maybe be an issue, but I honestly don't see it taking many rounds from the Bolter, and if he really had to, Titus could just go straight down to the middle and rip it apart with a chainsword. <laughs> the Hunter is a very interesting issue. Isaac wasn't able to kill it due to the constant regeneration, and only managed to defeat it by incinerating it by starting the engine of a starship. While it's not a perfect comparison, jets in real life have afterburners that can reach 2000 degrees Celsius. Remember in the intro I Titus mentioned- Titus almost I died because of a carnifex. You're bolter? just a bigot! Yeah, it's that time. If we give Titus the multi melt This is- This is why when I made these videos, people would get mad because they were trying to say that I was trying to purposely nerf Warhammer 40k. It's actually the opposite. I was trying to be as fair as I possibly could be. And I was going off of the books that I read. Are there other books out there that perhaps portray space marines in a much greater, much stronger light? Probably. But I, out of all the books that I've read, they were, they were pretty similar to each other. There wasn't some crazy strength gaps. Like let's say that I read um, Ren's World, for instance. And then... The Space Marines in there were not like, oh my god, they're just 10 times stronger than the Space Marines that were inside, uh, let's say, the Eisenhorn trilogy. They really weren't. They were, they were still generally the same. Same thing with the Grey Knights. Like, the Grey Knight Omnibus, they were strong. But uh, one of the Grey Knights in there, I, I, dude, all right, at this moment, it, it escapes me. I think his name was maybe Alric. I don't remember. The main character. It, like the, I read that book like 10 years ago. But anyways... Um, he got stabbed through the chest, and that basically incapacitated him. Now, mind you, if I got stabbed through the chest and the blade came out the front, I'd basically be dead. Uh, he survived. But it still took a while for him to heal and, and to recuperate from that. It's not like he got stabbed through the chest and he, like, grabbed the blade, snapped it off, and, like, pulled it out the back, turned around, and just started, like, pummeling people like nothing happened. It still will incapacitate them. People act like space marines can fight until their bodies, like, disintegrate it. No. Even in uh, the Great Works, um, that's the one with Belisarius Call. There is a there's a Primaris Marine specifically that gets sliced in the chest once by a gene stealer, and it does not. The apothecary specifically mentions that it didn't hit any vital organs, and the Space Marine had to use that furnace to go into hibernation mode. Otherwise, he would have died. He would have died from a single slice to the chest by a gene stealer that specifically punctured no vital organs. He would have died if he didn't go into hibernation. Okay, but you know, hey, uh, Titus could get decapitated and his body will just keep punching, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but thanks for that donation, Inquisitor Media. Then we got Esco with 50 knocks. Thank you, my good man. They're giving them too much praise, just like Buttermilk Bob. <laughs> I, I understand that Space Marines have a cool factor to them. I agree 100%. I love Space Marines. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, not Primaris Marines, though, but I do like Space Marines. That being said, you got to be fair to them. You can't act like these, like people want to act like these are demigods walking around. They're not. Dude, they're not. All right, let's continue. Delta, which is essentially a short range to flame shotgun. It's stated to release flames that burn tens of times hotter than the surface of the sun, which sits around 5,500 degrees Celsius, which is already far over the 2,000 degrees of jet engines. So the Melta could incinerate the hunter. Right, but you already mentioned that this was essentially like a non sequitur because you're comparing a sci-fi jet engine compared to like what we have in our modern day and time. 
So this is kind of this is already an unfair comparison. You also have to consider sustained burn versus a initial blast of heat. On the spot. If you, you see, that's like a shotgun Titus blast. That's not like a sustained beam. He can still easily rip it apart, just like any other enemy he's fought for centuries. Oh shit! And while of course that wouldn't kill it, he could just run from it like Isaac did. Though he may not think to incinerate it with the starship afterburners or just may not know how to start them since, you know, different technology. In that case, he'd just have to keep destroying the hunter until he got down to age 7, which should be pretty easy for him. The twitchers on the US and Valor having superhuman speed doesn't really change anything either. Isaac is able to react to them and Titus himself has superhuman speed along with almost everyone he fights. Even if they did manage to attack him once again, it's highly doubtful they could even pierce his armor, they'd be easily swatted away just like the rest. The zero-g areas in the vacuum of space- But Titus doesn't wear a helmet, what about that? This wouldn't be an issue due to the <laughs> fact that not only does Astartes armor allow you to breathe in space, but Titus has experience fighting in zero-g, so this should be nothing new to him. Before we get to Aegis 7 and the hive mind, we gotta talk about the marker. The marker's effects on people can vary drastically. Your ability to resist being driven insane by it can be determined by your intelligence or mental willpower. And while for many other characters this is one major Shit. issue that denies them from surviving the Ishimura with 100% certainty, for Titus this would just be another- I was gonna make a very inappropriate joke and say was that person trans? Or Tuesday. All Astartes are trained to resist the influence of the warp and nothing. its chaos gods. The warp basically being the marker but on steroids. While some marines do fall to chaos, they're the extreme minority, and Titus specifically has a particularly strong resistance to the warp. But even if we were just using a random ultramarine instead of Titus, most Astartes have fought chaos for hundreds of years without succumbing to its influence, and just like the marker, the closer you are to chaos and the more chaos there is, the harder it is to resist. If there were any group of characters capable of resisting the marker's effects, it would be the Astartes. So in this case, I think the marker signals are pretty much a non-factor as well. Once um, this is also another non-sequitur fallacy that because space marines could potentially resist the warp, therefore they would resist the markers. These are not the same thing. Now... Are they psycho conditioned and stuff to resist these things? Sure, but we, as we've seen in Space Marine 2, they're not psycho conditioned and well trained enough not to back talk their own commander. <laughs> Hell, dude, they turned they they made Lieutenant Titus a total bitch in that game. My man was getting gossiped in. Even his own dudes tried to kill him. The dude, the dude was believing a random astropath and tried to kill his own lieutenant. Dude, the astropath wasn't even trying to give him any kind of influence. He basically just said, like, ah, oh, you're a heretic. You're going to kill Baldius Kalgar. And the guy's like, oh, what? And he just tries to kill his commander. He wasn't even underneath the influence of the warp. So there goes your psycho conditioning right there and resistance to the warp. My man tried to kill his own lieutenant. And he didn't even get punished for it. What's up, Golden Reaper? Just got here. Uh, what happened yesterday? I got disconnected. That's what happened. <laughs> arriving on Aegis 7 and coming here, my the man. smaller necros, the only challenge that would remain is the hive mine. With bolter and chainsword in hand, Titus should have little trouble making short work of it since, well, do you really want me to say that Titus can't beat an enemy that Isaac, a borderline normal human, could? Because no, no, I'm, I'm not going to say that. Titus should be able to pull it off and survive the events of Dead Space 1, and with that we move on to Dead Space 2. That's the Ishimura. Yeah. Used to be the pride of the CEC. It's a sad story, actually. I heard everybody on board died. We're going to run into a lot of issues here if your only argument is going to be that a space marine is stronger than a human. And so anything that Isaac does, simply Titus will do better. If that's your reasoning from the very start, then this entire video is mute. Because then you're admitting that from the very get-go that Titus would simply do everything better than Isaac ever could. Some sort of terrorist. Uh, we got Vessel. What's up, my good man? Good to see you here. Um, uh, if, we are, if we are to listen to this guy, there won't be 
Chaos Space Marines at all. Old lore suggests entire chapters falling to chaos. I guess good lore won't be missed. You're right. You're also a bigot. Um, thank you for those Bulgarians, my good man. It's just the idea that like the writing has gotten worse over time. And so when it's time to talk about a space marine, they're like these incorruptible, unstoppable, you know, just immune to all damage type things. And it's, it starts getting way out of control. As I said, there's stories of space marines punching chunks out of each other's armor and cracking their own ceramite, especially when it comes to space marines versus chaos. Oh, but that's a space marine. But it still talks. I'm, okay, let's talk about humans at this point. If I wore full armor, let's just talk about um, whatever, old medieval knight armor, right? We're both wearing heavy medieval knight armor. If you and I get in a fist fight, do you think I'm going to be like cracking open and destroying your armor as I'm punching it? Probably not. Probably not. So if you if you think about, and I, I get that space marines are stronger than humans, but if you really think about that idea of space marines breaking each other's armor open and just cracking this shit apart while they're beating each other, and then, and then you act like, okay, but anything else cannot break it open or crack it. It's just crazy. Remember, it's not just the armor alone, but that space marines have, they're very well versed in tactics and like deep strike maneuvers and shit like that. Like these dudes will deep strike in whether they're dropping in from the sky or they're dropping in from um, one of their uh, ships, like a Thunderhawk or something. They do like surgical strikes. They under, they're, they're not just walking through front lines and it's just like 10 billion rounds of ammunition firing into them and they're just walking through it like Superman would. They don't do shit like that. Now, there is a lot of hyperbole when it comes to the codices. And what is written there. But once you actually get into the stories and you start reading this shit, it is nowhere near what people are putting. This is why I don't like lore videos too much is because there's a lot of hyperbole that they take from the codices. They put it into the videos and then people, I don't want to be too mean, but people like this. And it's, it's I don't want to be too shady towards this guy because overall the video is okay. But they take that hyperbole and they take it as a literal and then they begin to make videos like this. And so it's like a non sequitur built upon a non sequitur and it just starts getting worse and worse where it's like at the end of the show, this you're not even talking about Lieutenant Titus no more. Now you're talking about uh, fucking Henry Cavill being Superman and then like, you could shoot this dude in the eyeball and it would just deflect off. It's like, what, what, when does it end? We got Golden Reaper with the 10 bucks. Thank you, my good man. This would make people mad. I'm reading Honorary to the West. I am at chapter 47. Sun Wukong may be immortal seven times and power... Hold on, this, this is scrolling, so I got to scroll back up. Uh, Sun Wukong may be immortal seven times and powerful, but he does lose fights and he asks for help a lot from the gods because he can't handle it. No, I got you. I got you. And, and that's the thing too is that just because you're highly resilient doesn't just mean that you automatically win, so to speak. I also don't like the idea that he would be he would be basically immune to like all the necromorphs except for like what maybe three of them. I think that's absurd. Once you read these books, you recognize that there are real threats to space marines. It's not one space marine versus a million dudes, and the dude just t poses and he's spinning in a circle and just it's like a blender going through the whole crowds. Like that's not what space marines do. They just have a lot of legend around them because of their capabilities, but they do surgical strikes. But anyways, let's continue. It's attack. Thank what? you, dude, for the donation. I really appreciate it. Terrorist attack? What happened aboard that ship was no terrorist attack. What do you mean? That's where all this started, Ellie. Everything that's happening here happened on that ship. For Dead Space 2 and 3, I'm only going to talk about enemies or obstacles that are new since they reuse a lot of the same enemies and environmental hazards, All right. and going over them would just be a lot of repeating myself. Okay. The first new environmental obstacle Titus would have to look out for are the multiple windows and areas of the sprawl that could easily decompress if accidentally shot at. With Titus being a literal space marine, Damn. I'm sure he'd be familiar with fighting in similar situations, a literal and space even marine. if he wasn't, he could easily shoot the lockdown button before he was sucked out into space, assuming he would know to do that. In the scenario where he does get blasted out into space, unless he can grab onto the side of the sprawl, he could be cooked here, but I think it's highly unlikely, 
especially if you gave him the jump pack, then he'd be completely fine either way. One of the new enemies introduced in Dead Space- Okay, this is missing so many points here. So, in a situation where he could lose, just now give him an upgrade that would save him? How often are we going to do this? If he had to go up against one of the big necromorphs, and it would kill him. What we could do is just arm him with an orbital bombardment, and then he would survive. How often? You could do that for every situation. There's like a literal gigantic necromorph in front of him. But if we were to give Lieutenant Titus a last cannon with unlimited ammo, then perhaps he would survive. Of course he would. Or at least you're increasing the, like, he's not even surviving in this universe no more. Now we're just giving this dude free passes. I, okay, Batman, could he survive in Warhammer 40k? Okay, so uh, Batman meets up with the Emperor, and the Emperor is at full power. But if we gave Batman five years to prepare for this fight, and he knew exactly what the Emperor would do, I think Batman would survive. That's fair? Uh, Batman versus an entire legion of space marines. Uh, but we give Batman 10 years to prepare for this entire event. And he has all the devices he needs for that specific moment. I think at that point he might survive. It's like, say it ain't so, dude. Ancient now two bucks to get my good man. I have a feeling he's making assumption than being true. I'm just being hypercritical because, because like I said, I lived and breathed these videos for a while. And I kind of think we're giving too many free passes here. Like you're, this is not being fair at all. It's it's assuming that, okay, uh, because this man right here is human and uh, Titus is a space marine, well, whatever situation he's in, Titus just wins by default. Oh, what's that? He, he might be blasted off into space. Well, we could just say that he has a jump pack and he'll be okay. It's like, uh, what? We're asking if he could survive in his universe, not that we could just change his loadout whenever it's necessary. That's kind of boring. But they get, but then again, you know what? This makes sense because we're talking about an ultramarine here and they have the best plot armor. So maybe my man is being lore accurate. These two is the puker, which use their stomach acid Thank as you know. a projectile to melt anyone unfortunate enough to be in the same room as them. So maybe they could melt through Titus armor, right? Well, no, because some Tyranid bioforms similar to Xenomorphs have acidic blood capable of melting through armor, which I highly doubt acid made from a human stomach could compare to. Even if it was capable of eating through Titus armor, the power gap is so massive he'd easily be able to speed blitz and one-shot the puker anyway, so just like <laughs> the rest of the necros we've discussed so far, they shouldn't be any trouble for an Astartes. The next enemy we have to talk about is the tripod, which to be- Oh, Ty oh Titus would kill it. Uh, the tripod would come out and he would turn it into a one pod. Game over. Fear is much larger than most necromorph types. The problem is that its long arms are massive Thank you, David. that Titus could easily rip off with Shout out to David for the gifted or with subs. the chainsword. The standard bolter could probably blow its limbs off as well. Coupled with the fact that it's not particularly fast and I don't really see it posing much of a threat. The train sequence shouldn't pose too much of a problem assuming- Yeah, the train sequence wouldn't mean nothing. Titus would jump out and run faster than the train. And Titus can actually fit his fat ass into the fucking train. Though, in order to jump between the cars, you might have to give him the jump pack. The Stalkers are an interesting enemy type. The Stalkers won't work. Uh, Space Marines can see through the dark, and they have radar, and so therefore, Titus is absolutely immune to any kind of ambush whatsoever. Using hit-and-run ambush tactics rather than the standard, straightforward aggression of most other Necros, but once again, they're so tiny in comparison to Titus, and combined with his heightened senses and the fact that his suit basically gives him aimbot, I don't think a stalker is big or strong enough to actually harm Titus, even if they did land a hit, which I find to be pretty unlikely. Now, the Tormentor could be an exception when it comes to- the Now, the Tormentor won't do nothing. So if, if Titus just had like a last cannon, he'd just blast right through it. Uh, it's basically like a Kamehameha times 1000, and it wouldn't do nothing. This guy couldn't even- I don't think he could even scratch the paint off of Titus's armor. The Necromorphs. It's around four times bigger than a brood. It's bigger, therefore it's better, I'm sorry. Capable of easily picking up huge chunks of metal, and is pretty big even in comparison to the gunship that's hunting Isaac. Besides the hive mind and maybe Leviathan, this is the first necromorph I think could potentially damage Titus. 
Unfortunately, its downfall is the massive weak points on its arms and the fact that Titus and other space marines are experienced fighting foes much bigger and stronger than them. The oh, Vulture shit. or Chain Sword should easily rip through its weak points and Hive Tyrants are pretty comparable in size while also being a lot smarter. Titus also fought a Lord of Change inside the Immaterium where it's at its strongest and if you're familiar with Lords of Change, you know how strong they can be. Not only dwarf- Um... That was- I, I don't think that that's even fair to say that he was fighting a full force Lord of Change. This thing was like an image that popped out and just shot a couple of shit at you, but didn't really do- Like, was he really fighting it? Was it an illusion? I, I think a Lord of Change would have stuck around a lot longer. Anyways. Thing beasts like the Tormentor or Hive Tyrant, but being capable of stopping time and casting other insane spells. Though, to be fair, Titus Mini did Calgar. have help in that fight. He didn't solo it or anything. The Halo Jump shouldn't be an issue for Titus, assuming he can fit into the launcher and know how to activate it. But even if he can't, if he has the jump pack, he'll be fine. Why is he Once comparing the games then lore accurate books? Of Earth Gov soldiers hey man, with pulse rifles. It's almost like a confirmation bias, but you know what? Titus would win. You're just a bigot. Pulse rifles fire extremely low caliber rounds and can have trouble tearing through raw necromorph tissue, so there's no chance it's doing anything to space marine armor. Oh Titus shit! Titus is going to make easy work of them. The last new enemy left to deal with is the Ubermorph, which is basically just a hunter. So either give Titus the Melta, which one shots him, or he can just rip it apart as he needs. Just give him the Melta? Damn, dude. Why why not just give him uh, Terminator armor? Why not just give him like a Dreadnought that he can call in and deep strike at any moment? I, I don't, I, I don't, why not put Titus inside of a Dreadnought? <laughs> hey, hey, if Titus got like injured, then you just put him inside of a Dreadnought and now he wins in that situation, right? Needs to until he gets to an area it can't reach. Since Titus isn't Isaac and can resist the marker, he won't be dealing with visions of Nicole and won't have to do- So we've already defaulted to him immediately resisting the marker because he has resistance towards the warp. Those are not the same thing, but okay. Do the whole final battle in his head thing that Isaac did at the end, especially since Titus didn't build the marker. You know what this is kind of like? Uh, do, are you guys familiar with like bulletproof vests and how they can stop rounds? but yet they don't stop knife stabs. In a way, it's kind of like saying because it can stop a bullet, therefore it'll it'll stop like a, let's say like a war hammer, right? Oh it, oh, it could stop a bullet, so therefore it could stop like a war hammer. And, and you hit this dude dead in the, in the fucking chest with this thing and he won't even feel it. It's like, huh? What if you turn it around and have like the spike? Oh, that won't do nothing because it could stop a bullet. It's like, we're getting a little crazy here. So this is where Dead Space 2 ends for him, and we have to move on to Dead Space 3. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. There we go. Jesus. Let's not do that again. Can you make it to that cargo dock? Yeah. Do yeah, you think there's air on board? Ellie's SOS is coming from somewhere inside, so let's hope so. You're For right, the David. Ship graveyard, you're definitely gonna have to allow. T you're right. He, uh, David said, uh, "Don't you know, Gamza, that even if Titus died, he would just come back from the warp as the Emperor's true angel of death and just be stronger than before." You're right. He would come back as Legion of the Damned. Damn you, Gamza! I'm back again. He's all like wreathed in flame, and now he's got flaming bolter rounds, just destroying all the necromorphs. Titus to use the jump pack. Otherwise, he'd me. just be drifting in space. The first of the man, type oh, shit. are necros that can use guns and axes, both of which shouldn't pose any real threat to Titus. The two hunters should also be light work with or without the Melta. Once landing on Tau Volantis, the below freezing temperatures should really be nothing for Titus to handle since his suit keeps him warm in the vacuum of space. The giant necromorph spider should be pretty similar to killing any of the larger Tyranids and the hive mind shouldn't be much more of an issue than the last. All of the threats on Tau Volantis are either the same or slight variations of enemies from the previous two games that I think Titus has proved to be able to handle pretty easily. But there's one enemy the that's it. really going to determine if he can survive. The Brethren Moon is massive in size and hyper intelligent. The fact that Isaac managed to kill one is some of the most insane plot armor I've ever seen 
but due to the fact that Isaac did in fact kill one, I can't say that Titus wouldn't be able to do the same thing purely based off that fact. Of course once you get to the point where multiple brethren moon show up, then Titus stands no chance unless you have the ultramarine chapter back him up with capital ships that can- Kai! What, what specifically did you want to debate about? Superman would whoop Goku's ass. Well, that's because Superman is an American, so he would have to win by default. Um, he's making a lot of silly arguments I can debunk right now. Uh, that depends on w what kind of arguments do you think that I'm making right now. Can glass entire planets. So can Titus survive the Dead Space franchise? Sure. He can, but it depends on a ton of variables. If you think he gets hard blocked by some technical limitation and not being able to find an alternate way around it, then he doesn't. For certain situations like the Halo Jump, you'd have to give him the jump pack, and unless you allow him to have outside help, he definitely doesn't survive the end of Dead Space 3. Only a very small handful of enemies could even pose a threat to an Astartes, and the ones that have any potential of harming Titus shouldn't be much trouble to take out. The vacuum of space and toxic gases are no sweat thanks to his compressed suit, and he should have little trouble resisting the effects of the marker due to his resistance to the warp, which works very similarly but is arguably much stronger. In conclusion, Titus can survive Dead Space 1 and 2 assuming he doesn't get stuck due to not being an engineer, and can survive up until the very end of Dead Space 3 until all of the Brethren Moon show up, which at that point you'd have to allow him outside help in order to survive. But do you know who could without a doubt survive the events of Dead Space? Oh shit! Our two channel members, Sith Lord 906 and Oh Titus shit! Acorn, a huge thank you and- They survived! Alright, let me, let me uh, drop this real quick. Let me see what Kai is saying here. But wait, Kai has joined the live stream to discuss with Gamza. Alright, what's up Kai? Yo! Uh, call me asshole real quick, just say something. Kai? Yo, can y'all hear me all right? There you go. There you go. Bet, bet. All right. All right. What did you want to talk about, my man? All right. All right. All right. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Not much. So, first of all, I want to say something very important right now. Hey, Gamso. So, first of all, I would just like to say. All right. Super Heavy Webs guy, give me a second I here. Let, let Kai you. talk, dude. All right. Go ahead, Kai. Sorry about that. All right, no, you good, you good. One thing I'd like to say is I appreciate you for reacting to the video and being honest, being honest, criticizing the video. I appreciate it. Uh, but I did want to talk about some points that you made throughout the throughout the reaction. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Uh, I don't have no problem reacting to it or anything else like that. I would say that if you have a question with uh, what I was saying, I do a lot. And I'll just be straight up with you and like more honest and more serious with this. Uh -huh. I do a lot of uh, trolling for the most part, and I talk a lot of shit. To me, it's just more oh, yeah. fun. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot of uh, hyperbole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you got questions, no, I say no, fire no. away. Yeah, I, nah. Yeah, I, well, bro, fucking, I had some of your subs come into like my comment section. They were like, "Oh, you're copying like this guy," and I'm like, "Oh shit, did somebody <laughs> like do the video before me?" I'm like, "Did I copy somebody on accident?" Dude, and so I never heard of you before, so I'm like, okay, is this guy like, is he gonna just be like contrarian? Like, what's his like vibe, right? I couldn't tell. Asshole, that's his vibe. So I couldn't tell if you were just being like hostile at first or what. But you did make some points that like I'm not here to like fucking. Oh, I'm gonna debate goon you. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know use rat arguments and try and like make you look bad. Like I'm not here to do that. But I just did want to talk. Just about lay down points. a bunch of gotchas. Ah! No, okay. Yeah, I used yeah, to yeah, make exactly, these videos exactly. a lot, but I stopped making them. A long time ago but i'll say this even if you like i know that you just mentioned that um you didn't know about these videos previously even if yeah. you were trying to copy them i wouldn't even care i would just be like go for it so i that's no well, problem yeah yeah, yeah. no nah, not nah. well it's not it's not necessarily like that it's more of like you know there's a thousand power scalers on youtube yeah and i i'm not I, i'll be the first to say i'm not the like the number one best power scaler in the anime community i'm not the number one best in like Oh, it community. gets sweaty. Well, it gets too sweaty. But yeah, it get, and I used to be a lot more sweaty than I am these days. I'm a lot more like relaxed about it. But one thing I do kind of pride my channel on is thinking of uh, like matchups 
that most people probably wouldn't think of. Like I recently did, uh, like could a predator hunt Delta Squad from Star Wars? Oh, okay, I got um, you. So I, yeah, so I'm like, oh, I hope I didn't do like an idea somebody else already had type shit. No, I said do it all, dude. Do everything. Yeah, yeah. you gotta farm but it. One thing, one thing I did want to say because you were talking about there's a lot of hype, uh, like hyperbolic statements in 40k. And at the beginning of the video, I, I, I even mentioned like I'm a really new 40k fan. Um, okay. So yeah, there's like even in, in the video, people were bringing up that uh, like they have magnetic boots and stuff like that, um, which I, I think I had heard about. I had just forgotten about completely. So there is some stuff that I definitely messed up in that video for sure. Um, but what I will say is with the hyperbolic statements of, you know, space Marines and stuff like that, it, it you know, it, multiple riders, you know, inconsistent riding kind of makes that type of shit happen. One story has, you know, fucking Titus taking on a Lord of Change and then the other one will have a space Marine get folded by like a random grenade, you know, or something yeah. like that. Um, but my, what I wanted to say about that is that what I typically like to do, especially in those videos is try to give characters the benefit of the doubt otherwise my entire comment section will just be people saying oh you're downplaying this character so you know fucking uh they'll lose or something like that or or whatever so i i try to give them some benefit of the doubt to a reasonable extent like i'm not gonna sit here and be like well you know titus can fucking fold uh an entire chaos invasion by himself and uh it actually takes some um, a, a fucking nuke to kill him or something like that that's why i was kind of like i want to go for like a middle of the ground interpretation so i'm not going to say he gets like one shot by two slashers but i'm also not going to say like uh the tormentor couldn't even harm him you know something like like that i got gotcha. you yeah um, so like you, if you power scale like you you i'm sure you're familiar with the fact that like there's higher interpretations and lower interpretations of characters, even characters that have a singular author. Yeah, it's also, it's, it's kind of like trying to find that middle ground and I got you on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, otherwise then it's like, you could just take somebody at their most powerful and then they could just steamroll through certain instances. But if you take them at their lowest and they can just get squashed. So I get you on that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I usually, I, I'm a bit of like a mid baller. I tend to like, midball almost every character i talk about because i don't want to give them too much credit because then all the comments are like oh you had to fucking be disingenuous and you know hype beast this man up for him to win <laughs> but then if i lowball him too hard i get the opposite like reactions what what uh, the way that i would do my videos or the way that i did do them was i actually ignored the audience entirely i don't I mean, give yeah, a shit if a they get mad or not idea. i'm just looking at I mean, it that's as a good idea yeah is this going to be as fair and, and as I see it? And so, like, reading through some of the books, like the, the Great Omnibus, Rin's World, uh, the Eisenhorn Trilogy, I went through The mm -hmm. Fall of Damnos, which is a terrible book. <laughs> but uh, I try to take those, and I find that the Space Marines overall, they're fairly mm -hmm. equal when it comes to being across the board. I don't really see too many instances of, in one book, the Space Marines are, like, nigh unstoppable, and then another book, they're just getting killed by, like, rocks or some shit. Now, I'm pretty sure that there's instances out there, but across the books oh, that I've read, I just is. try to keep it, like, consistent between those. Obviously, that's yeah, more yeah. anecdotal, but that's all I can go off of. I, I'm not going to go off of, like, 100 books that I haven't read. Well, like, like, for example, like, besides the whole, you know, Games Workshop statement of, like, well, technically, you know, either nothing's canon or it's all canon, you know, that type of shit yeah depending on which one you want to go with if you want to go with like none of its canon then i guess none of it really matters but if you go with the idea of like pretty much all of its canon like even extended media like video games and stuff then you got to take into account shit like bolt gun where kaido solos like six lords of change and an entire chaos invasion by himself and it's like you can't even argue that's like anecdotal because he just straight up does it in the game yeah even fire warrior you kill a lord of change too and you kill a Lord of Change and Fire Warrior, for real. Like, as a Tau Fire Warrior. Yeah. You just go around, you have, like, that a melted gun and shit. Crazy. You're killing, all, you're killing like, Chaos Dreadnoughts and shit. That's hilarious. So, yeah, no, I, I got you on that one. It's just, like, let's be more realistic here. It's, it's almost like if you wanted to, you could take, uh, let's say, humans. And you're like, okay, the tallest mm. human in the world. Let's say he's, like, I don't know, eight feet tall or whatever he is. And then you say, what's the most weight a human has ever bench pressed and deadlifted? And then you could take all those aspects and go, okay, this is how strong a human is. And it's like, well, you'd be absolutely wrong because you're just taking the extremes. But I get you on taking like the average. What would be the average strength of a man or his height, etc.? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and well, another thing is like you know, like if, if I took like another Space Marine that uh, had lesser feats than like Titus, for example. Well, then you know, it kind of feels like I'm being disingenuous towards Titus because it's like if he has feats of doing this, even if they are crazy and kind of go against the lore. The problem with like when you power scale is like even if the writing is bad and there's plot armor shit, like for example, Isaac beating a Brethren Moon. Like, mm. yeah, clearly plot armor, he shouldn't have been able to do that. But at the end of the day, he did do that. So, like, saying something like, for example, saying, like, Isaac can kill a brute with relatively zero difficulty because he only, the only canon damage throughout Dead Space is damage that takes place within cutscenes. So, he never takes any damage from any of the brutes. And so if Isaac, someone who's borderline a normal human, obviously he's not, he, he's got, you can make some superhuman arguments for him, yeah. but he's definitely not as superhuman as any of the space Marines, can solo multiple brutes with no issue. Like, not only is a space Marine not having any trouble, but Titus specifically wouldn't be having any trouble either. You yeah, know what I, I mean? And, and the thing is, like, Titus never goes against, like, a ton of necromorphs at once because... In Dead Space, you only fight, like, small groups of them at a time. Right. And I think this also goes into, like, gameplay. Because I remember um, people talking about Kratos and saying that technically, yeah. you know, like, when you have to, like, run across, like, let's say a temple or something, <clears throat> that technically he should be able to do that like, almost faster than light. And, and then it just gets yeah, even, ridiculous. Even Corey Barlog, uh, yeah, even Corey Barlog had a statement on that. Because in an interview, somebody asked him, like, oh, you know, in lore, Kratos can do all these things. Or, like, in QTEs, he can do all these things. But, like, then he struggles to open, like, a door or a chest. Exactly, And, like, yeah. even Corey Barlock basically has to explain, like, it's just gameplay concessions. Like, sometimes you can't showcase the character at full lore. Yeah, all exactly. All the time. Yeah. And so I kind of see it the same so way, I, being, I like, putting a Space like Marine in Dead Space. Cut scenes only. I typically like to use cutscenes only, but with a game like Dead Space, where most of the cutscenes are just people talking, it's like, I kind of have to use gameplay and just pick and choose what I think like makes sense yeah well let me ask you this then so when you threw titus into dead space i would say my biggest criticism would be allowing him to essentially have unlimited ammo i think well, I that can, i can give you a reason for why i did that okay so i that's a theme i do for all like the, so i have like a whole video series of videos just like that you know two different characters are throwing a character into a different version or whatever the sure. reason I did that is because when you give, like, a character finite ammo, it it becomes, like, then you have to get into, like, vague speculation of, like, okay, at what point do they run out of ammo? And then that just gets, like, really messy because then it's, like, how do you even quantify that? You also have to quantify how much ammo they start with as well. And it's, like, it just gets kind of, like, messy and it's just, like... Eh, like you know type shit it's just like another another thing is that you kind of feel like you're downplaying a character because like if let's say titus runs out of ammo and all of his shit or whatever and mm -hmm. then i say he loses you know for whatever reason or you know it could be any character um well then you know it's kind of like well they lost because they couldn't use any of their equipment that kind of sucks like your their character isn't operating at their maximum capacity uh which they normally would be uh, but since you gave them finite ammo, they lost due to that. I think that would be so fair, though, because the, the idea, the, the premise of it is that they're surviving in another universe. Well, right, right, right. But, like, obviously, if I threw Titus, like, w with no restrictions in Dead Space, well, then he pretty much just has the Chainsword. I mean, he would probably still body 90% of the Necromorphs. But for other characters, you know, in, in other parts of the series that I've done... That wouldn't be the case. Like Delta Squad, for example, I did. If Delta Squad could survive the Ishimura, if they have no ammo in their weaponry, they just get folded because they're just clones. <laughs> so it's like right. Because I I, I did one where I took uh, I believe it was an entire chapter of Grey Knights and I put them into Doom's Hell, and a lot of they people got them. mad because I was talking about that. Eventually, they would just crumble, and they're like, "Well, that's yeah, not fair," and it's like. That's kind of the fucking point. They're in hell. Like, what, what am I supposed to just like, oh, but there's a little mini portal and they just have unlimited supplies coming through like the warp or something. It's like, well, that's not fair either. That just gets silly. But even then, they would they would get I mean, outmanned. I, yeah, I'm going to be honest. Even then, they probably still lose. Yeah, they would. They, they would. They, they ain't got, they're, they don't have that plot armor like that Doom Slayer does or perhaps Caldor exactly. Drago. That maybe would have yeah, been more like, interesting. 
Yeah, or uh, what I'm planning to do is uh, if Kaido could survive, like uh, like Doom Eternal is probably what I'm thinking about. Gotcha. Like the events of Doom Eternal, basically just swapping him with the Slayer since he's 40k's Doom Slayer. Like he's literally built to be that. Let me ask you this though, so that way we don't get too off topic. What were some of the uh, points that I made that you disagree with? Or you could um, ask well, me if I was making was real like points. The, well, well, the the main one was about like there being hyperbolic statements, because um, you were saying like, oh, you know, people will take like hyperbolic statements and run with it, and then yeah. do kind of like a wank space marines, and I like I I can see that, but the way I usually scale is. Like I said, Bolt Gun is an example. Titus is an example. There are definitely 100% like 100 examples of Space Marines just being fucking insane. Uh, objectively, by feats. And it's like, yeah, it can be plot armor and it can be like silly writing. But at the end of the day, like they did accomplish those things. Um, yeah. But at the, at the same time, um, like if you think Titus is way weaker than what uh, I think he might be or whatever... That's completely fine. Um, most of the time, power scaling is like interpretation based. There's usually high balls, mid ball, uh, mid balls, and low balls. Um, I just typically like to go for like mid balls, maybe leaning towards the higher end uh, or lower end, depending on the character. Um, but that 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 was really it. I do think there are Space Marines that are fucking insane, like Kaido. Uh, yeah, no, there there well instances not, of some crazy dudes out there. Especially yeah, if you yeah. want to pull, like, like characters that have full like, warp like, powers and shit. Yeah, exactly. And this isn't towards you. This is, <laughs> this is mostly towards your chat. But a lot of people are like, oh, this guy, he thinks 40k fucking solos fiction. I'm like, no, dude. Goku <laughs> by himself solos 40k. Like, for, 40k is strong. It's a strong verse. But, like, if you watch, like, two anime, it gets there's, like, singular characters that fold the verse. Oh, no, easily, yeah. I also think a lot of other sci-fis destroy 40k. Like I, like, I know people get angry at this one. I say Star Trek obliterates 40k because the technology differences is huge. Uh, I'm, I'm not super familiar with Star Trek, so I really can't say. It, it gets silly. Um, it's, a, it's like magic in space at this point with their technology. Every, every you know, other episode uh, is a time travel episode where they're opening up different dimensions and shit, and they're just traveling through the shit. It's like it gets silly. Do you know uh, Pancreas No Work? No, I do not. Uh, he's a 40k lore channel, but he he basically made a whole video of like a bunch of verses that could be 40k. That was really good, um, and he brought up like a bunch of different sci-fi verses I've never even heard of. Um, I, off the top of my head, probably can't think of a sci-fi verse that can beat 40k, but I know they exist. But I can think of a lot of verses outside of the genre uh, that can be 40k. Like I'm pretty sure like. Fucking Malekith from Elden Ring could probably at least solo most of 40k. Maybe not the Chaos Gods, maybe, because then you get to conceptual, maybe higher dimensional shit there. But Yeah, it gets kind of fuzzy. Let me read what Golden Reaper said. Yeah. I'm not sure if he's asking you a question. Uh, Golden Reaper, 10 bucks. Thank you, my good man. I greatly appreciate it. He said, what about the different forms of corruption being corrupted by the warp has a different frequency than the moons? Like, you may be immune to fire, but magical fire may affect you. Yeah, no, I, I, that was one thing that I brought up too, is that uh, the corruption between like Dead Space and then 40K, it's not exactly the same thing like we were talking about with the warp and stuff and the moons. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a good point. I did want to I did want to talk about that as well. Um, so I agree, obviously, not one to one, but the logic behind that is the marker is arguably much weaker uh, its influence is arguably much weaker than the warp because the warp is something that is manipulated by arguably higher dimensional gods that represent concepts and it can affect the mind body and soul the marker only affects the mind and it can affect the body too but it's more of like a wave that is sent out and it affects your brain chemistry uh blah 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 right the war mm -hmm. can affect your can affect you on a spiritual level, on an astral level, uh, and the other two levels I mentioned before. And then also, if you look at where the two influences come from, the marker is an obelisk from what's essentially just an, a, a Xenos race, right? Uh, the warp is manipulated by chaos gods that represent concepts. So if you were going to make the argument for one being harder to resist than the other, it's probably going to be the warp. Uh, obviously, it's not 100% guaranteed Titus, uh, Titus can just 
uh, neg the marker signals. But I think if you were going to make an argument for any characters being able to do that, it'd probably be the Astartes. To a degree, yeah. I would also then argue, too, that the warp normally has to be present to begin with. So, like, the markers, it's almost like it's always sending out that signal, so to speak. It's always there. The warp, I wouldn't say that it's just at all places at all times, and it's always trying to gain its influence, so to speak. Sure, you could say that you have a mirror in the warp when it comes to, like, your yeah. emotions, and it can represent itself in those chaos gods. But it's not like that influence is constantly there for you, unless you're next to, like, let's say, uh, something that's channeling the warp, like a chaos marker or an idol or a warp portal opens up and then now you're underneath its influence and now you have to resist it yeah where well, a marker kind of seems like it's just marker, always right? like if you're nowhere near a marker then you won't feel the effects but if you're like on the issue more uh, fucking 30 feet away from it then you, yeah you're gonna feel the effects you get the microwaves <laughs> yeah you but... get hit with the 5g waves <laughs> just get that that 7g you just die brain melts but yeah. um yeah yeah so and that's the, that's the thing is that i was also say too is that in my opinion, when it comes to like space marines and the resistances, it kind of seems like it's all over the place. And in some instances, oh, yeah. it seems like it's non-existent. In other instances, it's like, I would say like with Titus, that would probably be a better choice because he's already been shown to be resistant towards the warp. And they never really explained yeah. why. Other than, oh, maybe you're a heretic or something. So, you know, maybe you could get like a pass with that one when it just comes like, hey, the marker, if he was going to resist it, it probably would be Titus rather than some random dude. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and that, but that was the thing. That I wasn't sure if you're just making a straight up like, well, if you can resist the warp, then you can resist the marker. Then it's like, well, I don't know about that if it's just going to be a straight one-to-one. -one. Yeah, I probably should have articulated that better on my end for sure. Um, and there was a couple points I missed. Like like I said, the whole fucking uh, Space Marines can magnetize their armor to the ground and stuff like that. Like there's some stuff that I missed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, I, yeah, I think those are small oh. things. I don't think that's too, that's too big of a deal. Because that, that's just getting into a lot of nuance at that point. Um, let me yeah, see. That, I think and, Golden see, Reaper has another question for bring... you. Oh, wait. Go ahead. Uh, Golden Reaper for 10 bucks. Thank you, my good man. He says, the way that I see it, it's not about strength. It's about uh, different ingredients. Well, affect different ways. Like different forms of viruses. Two, form, two viruses may be equal in infection, but they both work different ways. No, I got you on that one. I think you're still talking about like the marker and how the warp works and how the markers work. That yeah, Titus's yeah, yeah. resistance would not necessarily mean resistance towards the marker and stuff. I got you on that one. Yeah. I don't know if you wanted to expand on that more. It's up to you. Um, it, yeah, it, it, like I said, it really just comes down to if you could make an argument for one being harder to resist and more powerful than the other, it's probably the warp. Because uh, at the end of the day, like even the Brethren Moons themselves aren't that strong if they can be killed uh, by a stasis or a kinesis module from an engineer. <laughs> Granted, it was powered up and Isaac has plot armor. But, you know, like, can you can you imagine like the Tyranid hive mind being killed by like a single guardsman or something like that would be fucking insane. Yeah, it would it would be it would have to be like uh, Garzman Marbo. It'd have to be like some crazy plot armor dude. Yeah, see, th see, that's the thing. Like a character in forty K's power level all always depends on if they're named and how often GW shows their face. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Unless you're Malam Kaido, who never takes off his helmet, but he has a name. So, uh oh, that's how you know he wins. It's it's yeah, honestly exactly. it's just that's like why Star you Trek. Take of change. It's just like Star Trek. If you're not a named character and you're going on a mission, it's like guaranteed you're going to die. And yeah, then the main yeah, exactly. character will pull some crazy bullshit out of his ass. Just like, I, it, it, that's why I talk about like Star Trek being silly in some certain instances where I think there was like in Voyager, they were, tra they were trapped in like some pocket dimension. And then they're like, we got to get out of here. And then someone just hits like three keys on his like little keypad. And he's like, all right, like the portal's open. Let's go. And I'm like, what did you just hit on your pad? You guys are trapped in here for like the whole episode. You hit like three buttons and now there's a portal open and you can escape. I'm like, what did you actually enter? Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, if you were, if you were a non-named character, you would have died. Yeah, bro. G, G, well, fucking GW, fucking 40K works the exact same way. Yeah, I haven't even been a, a fan for like two years yet, and I've already noticed that. Yeah, it's all over the place. This is also why I don't necessarily like the fact that some of their authors are saying that there is no canon. And I, I think it's just more of an excuse for lazy writing and for them to just do what they personally want. 
Yeah, I was gonna say that kind of sounds like a cop out, so that they they can just write whatever the fuck and just not get criticism or backlash for it. Like, yeah, if you just have to get that contradicts the lore, they just throw their hands up and like, well, you know, technically, it's like, <laughs> really, bruh. I think it's like an excuse for Games Workshop just to have more authors producing products and not having to worry about those products being accurate. Or good. Yeah, it's just another book to sell. That's all that matters at the end of the day. Yeah, it now, like I said, I haven't been a fan for very long, but my understanding of GW is that they seem to be coming like a little bit more corporate over time, like business focused rather than it feeling like it's led by a team of people that actually care about the game and like 100%. the story. Yeah, that's the vibe I get. Yeah, 100%. It, that name that changed, I would say around the end of 7th edition for the tabletop game. That's when 8th edition was introduced and you had all the Primaris Marines coming out. A lot of lore changes with like, oh, you know, these, you had Belisarius Call as a character that was then introduced and the Primaris Marines and then Gilliman comes back and that's when everything started changing and they wanted to push the, the game in a different direction. This is also when they started becoming a lot less grim dark and a little bit mm -hmm. more, how would you put it? More diluted is the best way that I would put it. They really, they wanted to keep the aspect of being called Grim Dark, but it's not really displayed anymore. Okay, so if if you feel like 40K is becoming less Grim Dark, I got to ask you a question. Sure. What do you think about the Tau? The Tau? Mm, yeah, yeah. I think they're they're interesting. I don't know too much of what they've done, anything different with the Tau currently. I do know mm -hmm. beforehand it was more like it was a guise for them to be, you know, the greater good, bring all these extra aliens underneath their, their heel, so to speak. They would even take uh, deserters from, like, the Imperium and stuff. But then it just pretty mm -hmm. much turned out that they really weren't the good guy because they were sterilizing all of them, ensuring that they could never rebel against them as well. So if you take that aspect of the tell, I don't have a problem because it's almost like uh, – an, an attempt to show off as being the good guy, but in reality, you're also willing to sterilize your enemy as well. At the same mm -hmm. time, they still have a caste system where there's certain people that will never rise up against in the ranks and shit like that. The new Tau, I don't know if they've actually changed anything too specifically because I haven't followed them too close lately. Okay, because I hear, like, from what I've heard, a lot of people don't like the Tau. I personally really like them. Um, I think they're... Even even if, you know, uh, GW, like, changes it and they make it to where Tau are actually kind of the good guys, or at, at the very least, the closest to good guys that the 40k universe has to offer, I'd be fine with that. I think they contrast all the other factions really well. Um, but on the topic, because you brought up Primaris uh, Marines, the reason I didn't uh, bring them up at all in my video is just because I really did not want to get lost into the weeds of explaining space marines uh to because that was the first time i had uh featured 40k on the channel so i had a lot of people that didn't know anything about 40k and i really didn't want to have a 15 minute section of just explaining what a space marine is and like primaris versus firstborn and all that shit and no and i honestly, think you did good like, the difference between like titus when well, pre-primaris and after primaris doesn't really change anything so i was like i'm just not even gonna fucking bring it up no i think you did it on but, that i don't think that would be necessary to to bring up firstborn and shit yeah yeah uh, i personally don't have anything necessarily against primaris i wasn't a fan when primaris came out and that whole controversy you know blew up yeah um as long as you make uh, like the the established really cool characters primaris and you, you don't try and make them outdated or anything like that i'm perfectly fine with that um as far as gilliman coming back I don't know a whole lot about it, but from what I've heard, I don't think I have an issue with it. I just want Vulcan to come back. If Vulcan's the only other Primarch to come back, I'm fine. I'm a I'm a Vulcan's big Salamander cool. fan. Yeah, yeah Salamander's Vulcan pretty cool. is my guy. I played Salamanders for a while back in, I think it was 5th edition. They were a lot of fun with drop pods coming out with melted guns and shit. Stuff was fun. Yeah, dude. Uh, Nelp Fucking says, crazy. some excuse 40K as a noble dark or a gray area. Yeah, I, I think people have... There's so many different interpretations of Warhammer 40k. Some people think that it's just satire or a parody and shit. It goes all over the place. So it's kind of hard to say on that one. But in my opinion, I think I think, where it peaked was 3rd okay. edition. 3rd edition is, in my opinion, where 40k peaked, where it took itself more serious. The, I think the stories mm -hmm. were phenomenal back then. They were real gritty. Uh, a lot of stories kind of ended in like a Pyrrhic victory where it was like you win 
but you're you suffered such catastrophic losses it's like did you really win at the end of the day and that's what i liked about 40k was it was like humanity was surviving but humanity was still getting beaten down and worn down in the process and i think that's why a lot of that grim dark pretty much left when gilliman came back because it was like oh the, there's a, a new hope coming back gilliman's back oh by the way there's a bunch of space marines, Primaris marines, that have been hidden down, like in I don't know, in the basements of Mars or something, with Belisarius Call, and and now it's like, hey, we got a refresh supply of all these uh, new, stronger, spacier space marines. Gilliman's back. Uh, Black Templar, which hate witches, now work with Eldar witches to resurrect Gilliman. And I'm like, what is all this? It just it felt like there was so much stuff that was already established that got swept away just for this to happen. It was, it was too shoehorned, in my opinion. That's why I didn't like it. I would have preferred it if Primaris was more of like an armor upgrade. Like, let's say the the tech marines or something started coming up with new armor. They started sharing those patterns, and then marines were, were upgrading their armor and becoming Primaris marines, so to speak, because that armor upgrade gave them more resilience or something else like that. I think that would have been better, rather than saying, like, hey, these are all new spacier space marines with upgrades and all kinds of shit that has just been waiting here the whole time. And it's like, geez, what a, you know, what a great thing out of nowhere. It's like, happy birthday. Oh, by the way, Papa Gilliman back too. And it's like, okay, I don't mind Primarchs coming back. But at the same time, eh, maybe maybe it's worth it just because they also nerfed people like Angron. You had Angron, uh, you had uh, Magnus the Red and the Warp coming out like Saturday morning cartoon villains. Like, I'll get you next time. I'm like, why are these Primarchs so shitty now? I don't know. It was, just, it was getting kind of silly after a while. But it's, still, it's interesting I, that you say like you, you would have preferred that uh, Primaris just be like an armor upgrade or something. Because back when I was watching, I think it was like Major Kill's video on like why the Primaris Marines were so controversial. So like the, mm -hmm. the whole point of having, oh, Space Marines, but better. But except not really, because like one of the main, you know, points was like, oh, it fixes like the the issue with your gene seed. So like Blood Ravens won't have like the thirst anymore. They won't have the Black Rage anymore. And then like well then everybody's like well that kind of makes all of the space marines lame and none of them are unique anymore like you're taking away all their unique aspects so then they they kind of have to be like well you know they still have those aspects the you know the the unique qualities don't completely disappear and at that point it's just kind of like okay then what was the point yeah like now we just have like space marines 1.5 that are like slightly stronger and that's it yeah but like it, it's such a it's, it's such a like small like physical power boost that like in the actual stories you don't even notice a difference yeah so. i think initially when they first released the primaris i'd have to look into this a little bit more but from my understanding they started releasing books and making the pri the new primaris marines like absurdly resilient in the stories and then it kind of seemed like it tapered off and then they just became like normal marines again i i don't know the book I'd have to go find it, but I remember someone telling me in one of the comment sections that I think it was um, an Imperial Fist Marine that got shot mm -hmm. in the face with like a heavy bolter from a Chaos Space Marine. And like his face basically splattered open, but he just kept fighting because now he's the new Primaris and he's way more resilient. I'm like, this is getting silly. I get it. They can take those wounds, but I'm like, if you're just doing that for the sake of like, look at these new dudes, I think it's kind of cheesy, but eh, it is what it is. The other thing that I had a problem with though, when it came to Primaris, is stuff like uh, Dark Angels. Because Dark Angels had traitors in their line. And they hunt them down. And anybody that knows about their past, they consider it so shameful that they'll execute you as well because they don't want no one to know. And I think it's funny that you have these outsiders, these new Dark Angels, that you never even sanction them to wear your chapter signals or anything else like that. Sigils. All your markings, your, you can't even call yourself a Dark Angel. Like They would just kill you. And then out of nowhere, they're like, who are these new dudes that have been sitting on Mars? Hey, what's up, brothers? Come on in. Hey, you want to know our secrets? By the way, we have traitors amongst our ranks. Let's go hunt them together. I'm like, I cannot believe that in the slightest. Same thing with Space Wolves. Space Wolves would be like, you're not one of our brethren. We should just kill your ass. I think that would have been way more interesting if certain civil wars broke out because of it. But instead, it was just like across the board, all chapters unanimously like, yeah, hey, you know what? Maybe you don't like it, but it's all good. Come on in. And I'm like, what? You never train these guys. You never sanction them to wear your armor, your markings, your rankings, your anything. But you're just, no problem, dude. Come on in. I never trained you. I don't know who you are, but uh, come learn my secrets. And it's like, nah, I can't buy that. That's too much. Even if it was done by Gilliman, I don't think it matters because they follow their own Primarchs, like Space Wolves. 
Um, Space Wolves don't even adhere to the Codex of Stars. They don't give a shit about it. So why would they respect Gilliman yanking an order and having Primaris Marines coming in? They wouldn't care. Yeah, and, and one thing that gets me about the Space Wolves is don't they have a... I can't remember the name of it, but don't they literally have a trial that you have to undergo on uh, their Fenris? home planet in order to become like a fully-fledged Space Wolf anyway? Yeah, I believe it was... Uh... That's on Fenris, and I think they had, like, every chapter has stuff like that. You have to yeah, go through exactly. certain they rights and trials. Primaris Marines just show up, and they just don't have to do any of that. They're just Space Wolves. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't, th like, the Space Wolves don't seem like a chapter that would just let that happen. They'd be like, no, if you're going to be part of us, you have to do it right. Yeah, they would, they, it was the same thing with, uh, it, that should be all chapters across the board, because they're all, they operate independently. They follow their own rituals. They don't. Most chapters don't even see the, the, the emperor as like a god. They just recognize him that this is where they came from and he's basically like their creator. But they understand that at the end of the day, he's just a powerful human, if you will. They don't see him as like yeah. this entity. Some, some chapters could probably fall a little bit more into that. But they just see him more as like a father figure to themselves, obviously, along with their Primarch. But this idea that it's like some dude's going to show up and he's like, by the way, I got the same colors as you. And it's like, hey, brother, what's up? Well, come on in. That's just absurd. Chapters would be like, no, 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 no. We understand heresy. We understand like how the enemy can infiltrate us, and we're not going to just bring all these dudes in. But of course, the stories go in the way of the manner of like, well, you know, we tested their faith and we didn't find them wanting, so now they're just, you know, welcome in. I think they would start wars like that because how are you going to have like again? Let's use space wolves. How is Gilliman? Somebody who's outside the chapter because they follow Russ. They don't follow Gilliman. How is Gilman then sanctioning the shit that belongs to other chapters that don't even follow the Codex Astartes? It's like, yeah, they would respect Gilliman, but this idea of like, yeah, oh, what's that? You like, you sanctioned a bunch of uh, non-Space Wolf, Space Wolf dudes for us? Yeah, okay, no problem. I don't have a problem with it. They killed Inquisitor, Inquisitors. Um, they, is, who was it? they uh, literally fight Inquisitors and Grey Knights as well? Yeah, and they, they also killed like a whole legion of Sisters of Battle like twice. They, yeah. they, don't, they don't give a shit about any of that. And then I think it was uh, Logan Grimnar because they fought with Imperial Guardsmen. And then afterwards, the Inquisition wiped out the Guardsmen because they fought against Chaos. Logan Grimnar was pissed off because he was like, no, these were men that fought beside us. And now you're acting like the enemy and you slaughter them because you're afraid of the taint of Chaos. And so he vowed to also kill basically... I'm not sure if it was every Grey Knight that he came across, but or if, if the ones that he fought alongside, if you ever seen them again, he basically vowed that he would kill them. And I'm like, see, that's badass. That's cool. It shows that the Imperium isn't just this one big happy family, but obviously people have their own stubborn ways where they're going to see it as, no, this is the way that you're going to do it. And if you don't, then I'll just kill you too, because what's the difference? At the end of the day, I still fight for the Emperor and you don't outrank me, so I'll still kill your ass too. And I think that's more interesting. Yeah. Oh, it definitely is. Like when, Instead when of it just being hunky dory. Floor and I was being told that they went to war with the fucking Inquisition. Yeah. They gained my respect immediately. I was like, damn, Space Wolves are up. Yeah, no, same thing. Once, once I read those stories, I was like, okay, that's badass. Because it shows that they truly are independent from the Codex Astartes, the, the grasp of the Imperium. Because the Inquisition always is betrayed as like that bully faction that loves exactly. to kind of boss people around. And then it's like... Once you got space wolves going, uh uh, not here, I'll split your skull open. I'm like, okay, that's cool. That's how a space marine should be. Exactly, exactly. Because I'm not going to lie, I kind of hate the fucking Inquisition. Like, they're, they're a good, like, villain, and they can make for good stories. But, like, just as a faction, just on based on how they act and just how much I like them as a faction, I can't fucking stand them. I love it when they get bullied. Yeah, they're kind of like that necessary evil, which is what I do like them. But they're always yep. assholes in the stories. Even uh, exactly. Eisenhorn. Eisenhorn was an Inquisitor. And even he had to deal with the Inquisition a lot. And they, you, they're just through and through, they're all assholes. But it's like, I like it because it's kind of like that anti-hero where it's like a necessary evil where you understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, you're mm -hmm. like, damn, what an ass. Golden Reaper, two bucks. <laughs> yeah. Golden Reaper wants to know, what is your 30-second review on Space Marine 2 story? If you played it. Oh, mine? Yes. Um, oh, fucking 30 seconds. Fuck, putting me on the wire here. All right. Uh, I, I fucking loved it. Um, obviously, as soon as I saw Titus fighting a Lord of Change and going into the Immaterium, I was like, I don't know about that. I mean, like, 
I kind of let it slide with Bolt Gun because it's clearly supposed to be like a Doom clone. They're kind of setting him up as like the Doom Slayer of the verse. I kind of expected him to be nonsensically overpowered. And at the end of the day, it's just like a it's a Doom clone video game. You don't have to take it too seriously if you don't want to. Um, I still thought it was really cool, though. Um, I love that they teased Necrons. I was really hoping to see Necrons, uh, at, at least a little bit at the end. And it was a bit disappointing that we didn't get to see them at all. Even if yep. they just got to fight like a small handful, I would have loved that. Um, I think the writing between Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, Chiron, and Titus is all really good. But they could have definitely fleshed out those two more. Um, the whole suspicion of Titus... Uh, and his past between Gabriel, I think, was really was really good. And I think the bond that they forged towards the end of the game is really heartfelt, and they have some really good dialogue, especially at the end. Um, the chaplain being... Uh, uh, fucking, what's his name from Space Marine 1? Yeah, I got I can't you. remember his name. Yeah, uh, you can just I kind of saw that coming, but it was a cool twist regardless. I, it, Me knowing that it was coming didn't bother me when it happened. Um, I think they could... It, as far as, like... The writing goes and the story itself, it does feel a bit rushed. Uh, but other than that, like they could have fleshed some things out, especially Gabrielle and Chiron. Um, they definitely could have expanded uh, the story by an hour or two just to give it some room to breathe because that ending definitely felt rushed. Um, but overall, like I fucking loved it, man. Like I thought it was really good. Um. I would love to hear his 30-second review on Space Marine 1. That's from Darken for 20 bucks. Thank you, my good man. I really appreciate it. And then Ancient Nelt for 5 bucks says, Keep in mind, most stories that were amazing are all in the old lore, but just recycled over time. Great, A good example is 10th edition Codex is just a copy-paste. Uh, which Codex, my man? Are you just talking about Space Marines? And then uh, Darken also wants to know if you've played uh, Space Marine 1 and then what your 30-second review would be on that. Thanks for the donations, guys. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, yeah, uh, so, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna get some fucking, f uh, fraud claims on my head right now. I played Space Marine 1 about, I think, a month before Space Marine 2 dropped, uh, and I didn't finish it. I got probably about 80% through. Um, I thought it was really solid. I did feel it got a bit repetitive because I feel like there wasn't quite enough weapons to keep things fresh and interesting up until the end. Not that it still wasn't fun. All of the weapons feel really great. The melee combat still feels really good. The game is still pretty beautiful even to this day. It's aged very well. The combat itself is also, uh, like I said, really solid. The Really, the only thing is just that I feel like you're introduced to the entire arsenal pretty early. Which on one hand is a good thing because that gives you plenty of time to use all of the weapons. But on the other hand, th it, things start kind of getting really stale uh, towards the end. Um, but as far as the story goes, once again, I thought it was pretty solid. I think the whole suspicion of uh, the toward, at the end where uh, he, Titus is being accused of uh, heresy because, you know, the Astarte says this and blah, 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 blah. And of course, yeah. the Inquisition are being jackasses as always. Um, I thought that was an interesting ending. Uh, of course, it's 40k, so we can't have a completely happy ending. Um, but overall, I thought it was solid. Orcs, uh, I don't know how much hate I'm going to get for this, but Orcs are one of my lesser favorite factions. Um, and in Space Marine 2, we get to fight the Nids, and the Nids are my number one favorite faction in all of 40k. So, oh, okay, I gotcha. But Why overall, don't you uh, so like the Orcs? I do enjoy Space Marine 2 significantly more. Obviously, there's more content. It's more polished, blah, 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 blah. But I think overall Space Marine 1, while I didn't completely finish it, it aged really well. I gotcha. Uh, what about the orcs do you not like? It, it's not necessarily that I don't like them. It's just I like them the least in comparison to everyone else. Like, I tend to favor, like, the badass, like, cool, fa like, factions and so whenever, like, and this isn't just in, like, 40k, this isn't everything. Like, if, when I play a fighting game, when there's, like, a jokey kind of meme character, they're always my least favorite. Um, I always like, like, the badass characters. And the reason why the Nids are my favorite is because I love Eldritch Cosmic Horror, and they very much are that. And I also love the fact that they're just overpowered in comparison to almost everyone else. I just love the fact that in this universe uh, where you have all of these hyper-technologically advanced factions, you have this race of bugs that are completely biological, and just sheer evolution just outpaces everyone else except, like, arguably the Necrons, of course. 
Yeah, no, I got I got you on that one. And I do agree. With me, I'm not too much of a fan when it comes to like comedic relief. And that's why mm-hmm. I haven't found too much favor with the orcs. I like yeah. that's why I like the uh, third edition Necrons. I thought they were in my opinion that was good grim dark because you had the Catan that enslaved the Necron tier, turned them into Necrons. Yeah. And that's all that it was. They they weren't talking to each other. They they had everything was basically wiped out. And so you just had this army that would appear was dead silent and all you could hear was like their their uh gauss weapons basically just firing off and disintegrating people and that's all you would hear and then the march of their feet and i'm like that's cool it's like an eerie silence and all you hear is like their gunfire now it's like we got necrons running around with english accents arguing with each other and then the Catan never really uh, enslaved them this. this is new to me what the fuck yeah it, it, they changed it where the Catan totally enslaved them the new lore is that the Necrons rebelled against their enslavers and then they focus a massive weapon into the Catan and shattered them into like little pieces, little shards. This is all like war in heaven stuff, right? Basically, but th- that's how they changed it now. So okay. that's why I was just like, man, this new retcon, I know a lot of people liked it. I did not like it. I, I thought it was more grim, dark and more crazy to know that a full power Catan like the Nightbringer is coming back. And then he's been seen on Imperial Worlds, like absorbing all their souls and just you know, basically eating the planet. I'm like, that's cool. How would the like Imperium ever deal with that? Now is he's just a shard floating around like, hey, you know, I'm just a piece of my former self. And I'm like, yeah, it's like Pokemon now. They throw out these shards and like, go, you know, use slice attack or something. I'm like, this is silly. I didn't like that too much. When, go the Reaper 10 bucks. Up, we- Give me one yeah. second, dude. Uh, so you're happy with the Steven Universe heresy ending. Marines gossiping like high school girls, the ma'am officer, and the talking back to your commander not getting shot aspect. I think uh, he's talking about your Space Marine too. That, was, that would be one thing I would ask you is... Uh, how did you feel the writing on that? Because that was one of my big critical points about Space Marine 2. And that was that uh, these Space Marines should be psycho-conditioned. They, they are taken as children. So if they're taken as children and they're indoctrinated to become an ultramarine, one, they shouldn't even have accents to begin with because that should have been wiped out. And two, the whole point of heresy is that you don't resist your commander or your authority. And that's what they were doing throughout the whole game. And I'm like, the chaplain would have caved their skull in a long time ago. But I'm curious on your on your thoughts on that. Um, when it comes to resisting the chaplain, what is like the specific example? Because I, I might be misremembering or forgetting something. Um, not resisting like, the chaplain, if, if but there's Titus. a specific example. Um, for instance, like right at the very beginning, when um his, <laughs> Titus's two dudes were basically talking about him, saying like, "Yeah, he's got your command. He couldn't have been a primaris that long." You know, almost questioning like their faith in them to begin with. That was just at the very beginning. And then eventually, you had that astral path that was like, oh, Titus is a heretic. And then I forgot what the Asian dude's name is, but then he turns around and he's like, oh, you're a heretic, and then tries to kill Titus. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, th- yeah, that that is true. Like, uh, you, it was kind of weird seeing a uh, subordinate just openly defiant of his lieutenant and just basically calling him a heretic to his face and uh, like insinuating it con- and it was constant it was like all throughout the game it wasn't yeah. like just like one flip up so it is kind of crazy that he never got his skull bashed in for that <laughs> um now if you're talking about like now i can't make any excuses for the chaplain uh but if you're talking about like why didn't titus do something about it i think he probably knew that he already had eyes of suspicion on him to begin with and he probably didn't want to be in any less favor of others than he already was because he had just gotten his status as an ultramarine back so he was probably really trying to play to everyone's good side for the most part but yeah gabriel just openly shitting on him insinuating he's a heretic all this yeah. shit just constantly yeah that didn't make much sense here's the other thing too that i didn't like was um titus was reinstated by marnius calgar himself and then you had the captain. The first thing he said to him was that I have my reservations about like your return, essentially, or your reinstatement. And it's like, okay, what you just said there was that you questioned the decision of Marnius Calgar, your chapter master, who served before you were even born. This is crazy. That you're just going to out in the open say that you're questioning your commander's decision. And then when Calgar yeah, shows crazy. up, everyone's like jerking him off like, oh, yeah. And they should. He's a chapter master. But it's like. Weren't you just questioning his command by reinstating Captain Titus? All of you guys should be on board if you're chapter master. 
who's literally second to Gilliman, even in the lore, it, it, like his achievements, they say in, in their libraries are second only to Gilliman. Nobody even comes close to him after that. So I'm like, if this dude has been serving this long, he's got this much honor and respect amongst the years that he's been serving. Now you're questioning him? I, I, don't, I just, I did not like that at all. That is, that is pretty insane. I actually didn't even think about that. Yeah, that is crazy. Like, Calgar himself uh, reinstated Titus, and you're going to question that? Like, even if you are like, oh, I don't know about that, like, you keep that shit to yourself, bro. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. You openly say that. The whole point of the chaplain is to bash skulls in and keep the faith, so to speak. Exactly. If he got wind of any of that back talk, you would be disciplined immediately. Yeah. I think it was... um the book Rin's World, where the chaplain was questioning his brothers. One space marine hesitated for a moment to answer the question. He takes his crozius arcanum, the, the chaplain, and digs it into his shoulder. And he's like, is that, like, what, like, what are, you, are you, are you testing my faith kind of a thing? Or are you testing my patience, so to speak? Like, why aren't you answering immediately? And the space marine immediately started talking. But it's like, it goes, it goes to show how strict they are, that even you... Hesitating for a moment when the chaplain asks you a question, it's like, hmm, what are you now? What are you uh, stalling for? And the fact that he was already punishing him, <laughs> digging the Crozius Arcanum into his shoulder, like causing him to bleed and shit. I'm like, that's pretty hardcore. Now imagine talking back to your lieutenant, going like, oh, yeah, I think you're a heretic. And then you took you. What's the whole point of heresy in Warhammer 40k? You believe the enemy's lies. You allowed it to infiltrate your mind. The astral exactly. path comes out and says. You know, Titus is a heretic. He's going to kill Marnius Calgar. Then you have Mr. Asian dude coming out trying to kill Titus. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, that's heresy. You just took the enemy's lies and you tried to kill yeah. your own lieutenant with it. You should have been executed immediately. Exactly. What, so one thing I will say is that at least for Titus, you can kind of make the excuse, um, especially since he literally just got done being a black shield for like, what, 100 years or something like that. Yeah, a long time. Um, so he, he he's probably like maybe I should be a little bit more reserved, not immediately try and smash uh, Gabriel's head in, maybe. But with <laughs> uh, I think his name's Leandros. Hopefully, I'm not getting that wrong. But uh, the chaplain. Yeah. What I do like is the fact that he is the chaplain because the entire point and like narrative behind him in Space Marine One was that he lives too close to the Codex Astartes. Yeah, and Titus' whole point was that, bro, it's it's a it's a guide. You're not supposed to live your entire life by it one to one. It's supposed to help guide you through difficult times and in certain situations. But sometimes, like, you have to make your own decisions. You can't live your whole life by it. And he learned nothing at all. Instead, he yeah. became a chaplain, which is 100% fitting. So, <laughs> well, no wonder why those dudes are questioning Titus's command. He hasn't been doing a good job as a chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, I I got you on that one. Um, I'll probably wrap this one up here. I think it was a good conversation overall. Um, yeah, that was good, man. I'm gonna give you a, a sub and a like, and I'll take. I I'll probably be taking you. a peek at some of the other uh, videos that you release. I look forward to seeing more, yeah, man. Because oh, I think yeah, these man. videos they can be fun. Thank you. Uh, on on mine, I think you probably already know what channel that I'm on because I have two different uh, accounts right now that I'm running. But yeah. I definitely will, if you don't mind, I'll be looking at some more of your videos later on. Maybe not today, but maybe uh, in future streams and stuff like that. We'll take a peek. Oh, yeah, bro. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I appreciate you jumping on and having a conversation. That's something that a lot of people don't do and more people need to do nowadays. Yes, sir. Anytime. Anytime you want to get in call, I'm here, bro. Sounds good. All right. You have a good one, man. You too. All right. I think that was an interesting conversation, boys. I think Kai turned out to be a pretty cool dude.